Greetings. Well, here we are. A week already has gone by. We're in the middle of March. We're beginning here at Redwater Alliance our preparation for Easter, the Easter season. And I pray and hope that uh, you are well. And thank you so much for inviting me into your places and your spaces. I want to begin by asking a question. Have you ever heard of or do you know what COPD means? It means chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And this disease is incurable. And leading causes of this disease uh, are primarily smoking, uh, cigarettes or, or smoking. But it, incur also, it could occur also via secondhand smoke, for example, pollution, asthma can lead that direction and even our genetic makeup. Now, while this uh, disease, sadly, is incurable, uh, treatments are available to slow down the progression of, of COPD and, and to help with the, the symptoms that come with it. And the idea here with COPD is that it is a long functional decline in the person through four stages, four stages of COPD. Stage one is what is called, referred to the mild, and a person may not even be aware that there is a problem occurring. Stage two is the moderate stage, and this usually is where one would go see a doctor for a persistent respiratory symptom or symptoms. Stage three is referred to, um, I hope it's referred to, and by the way, I'm not a doctor, so don't take this as medical advice, but anyway, stage three is severe. This is where the shortness of breath gets worse and the physical activity is difficult and, and the symptoms really do begin to affect the quality of our lives. And the final stage is called end stage. This is where one would have chronic respiratory failure and difficulty just carrying out the normal tasks of a day. At the beginning of this month, I received a call asking me if I would be able to have some time to visit someone uh, in stage four of COPD, the end stage. And from the conversation I had on the phone, it, it, it was very apparent to me that this was a very serious situation. So upon my arrival, I was given direction to uh, Sally's room. And just for your information, Sally is a name that I made up. It's a true event, but uh, I didn't want to share the person's name. Anyways, with a polite knock on the door, I made my way into the room. I pulled up a chair by Sally's bed and just began to pray silently, uh, watching her uh, as she struggled for breath. It didn't take too long before I realized that Sally was not able to speak. And I found myself uh, drawn to her face. I noticed that her eyes uh, were struggling to focus and most of the time would roll back into her head, half there, half open. And her body, I noticed her body under the covers, this frail body. And it seemed like it wasn't even a part of her anymore. Then Sally would gasp for some air and, and her tiny frame would give a gentle shake under the covers and then stillness. Certainly for me, it was not hard to see that Sally had become so much less of her former self. Well, I continued to pray and as I continued to pray, somewhere in me, deep in me, Anger began to well up, to spring up, slowly. Not rage, just anger, the emotional anger. I asked, where was her family? Where was anybody who knew Sally? Why was she alone? Why was she dying alone? Was Sally afraid? What thoughts were going through her mind? What memories? I knew that she was cared for by others, but I also knew that they were very busy caring for others also, I wonder what they were thinking. How many have they seen alone in their last moments of life? It must be hard. As it was hard for me, I, I prayed for them. I noticed the bareness of the room. I just noticed that. There's no TV, no monitors, just one chair, one bed, and Sally and me. It's Kylan in that room. And as I, again, began to pray silently, and I say this with no shame, uh, tears began to form and make their way down my face. 
You see, I thank God at that time that Sally was not alone, that I was there. I thank God that even after I left, Sally would not be alone as God was right there with both of us. I prayed for Sally's salvation. I prayed for her family and her friends. And I'm not sure how long I stayed there because in moments like this, often for me, time seems to stop. But time came for me to leave. And I noticed that Sally's breathing became more labored, more pauses between the gasps of breath. And I really thought to myself, uh, not much longer, Sally, not much longer. I bent down near Sally's ear and with a louder than just a whisper voice, I said, to Sally. It's nice to meet you, Sally. Goodbye. The Apostle Paul reminds us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please turn in your Bibles to John, John's Gospel chapter 11, and we will be reading together from verse 17 through to 44. John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 17 through to 44. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me and believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? He said. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take it away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Verse 40, then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this season of preparation that we're in, preparing our hearts and minds and and our world around us and our own personal lives. 
for Easter Sunday. Oh, Lord, pray that you help us slow down and not rush to Easter Sunday. What a joyous day that is indeed. But to prepare our hearts and minds to read the stories in the gospel of Jesus' last days, what it meant for them in the first century, what it means today for us and in the world around us. For this story is a central message of Christianity. Without it, there is no such thing as biblical Christianity. Oh Lord, help us preserve it, help us remember it, help us to share it, help us to prepare ourselves. Help us, O Holy Spirit, to understand this message today. O Lord, set me aside and lead us by your Spirit. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting today until Easter Sunday, we press pause on 1 Timothy, if you've been following us with us in that series, as a, we want to deliberately focus on the final days of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John's Gospel, as I read, as we read together, will be our teacher as we move through this season of preparation. But I want to ask you a question as we start. Can I ask you this question? Are you a Christian? Now, stop for a second. Don't answer that too quick. But even if you've answered yes immediately, then the next question is why? Why are you a Christian? If someone came out of the blue up to you and asked you why you're a Christian, what would you say to them? Maybe one might say that, well, I'm a Christian because I go to church on a regular basis. Or one might say, I give to the church. I give the church of my time, talent, and treasure. Or maybe because I read the Bible, study the Bible, pray, and, and do good works in my communities and beyond. Or maybe as far back as we can remember, or I can remember, I have always gone to church. Why are you a Christian? What would you say to the one who asked you this? Well, keep that in mind as we look at now at verse 17 to 44 and the events that we find here which began on day one. These events here that we just read through began on day one, the day that Jesus received the news that his dear friend Lazarus was sick. That's at the very beginning of chapter 11. We did not read that. Maybe you can read that later. And a careful reading also informs us that Jesus and disciples were two days from the suburb community of Bethany. And Bethany was located approximately two miles from Jerusalem. And at this time, at the beginning here of this event, Jesus and disciples were located outside the province of Judea, Judea in the area that was known at that time as Perea. The context also reveals that Jesus was nearing the final days of his public ministry. In, relative, and, and in reality, short days away from crucifixion. And Jesus began to conclude his public ministry and spent all of his time basically with the disciples, preparing them for his arrest and death. As we look at chapter 11, and we look at this story of the death of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus, it is almost natural, it is natural, I would say, to focus our attention on the family of Lazarus, on Mary and Martha. Keep in mind that Jesus and his disciples had a long, good, and loving relationship with them. Now, there's nothing wrong with this focus, as they are, this family here in this uh, chapter are an important part of John's gospel and the events before us. Yet if we look at John's gospel as a whole, we will notice that his focus is really intended to point out that to us, his readers, that Jesus always had in mind the Father's will. For Jesus knew that his Father sent him into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's what John said in chapter 3. 
And this is clear even here in chapter 11, because after Jesus received the news that his dear friend was sick, he replied this to the messenger. Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus always had in mind his father's will. But let's stop for a moment. And let me ask you another question. When we hear of a loved one who has become sick, what is the first thing that comes to our minds? What's the first thing? Oh no, what's going on? Are they going to be okay? How serious is this? Is that not what pops into our minds? It's natural. It's normal. But let's be honest. The last thing to go through our minds would be the glory of God. It would be the last thing. Why? And here's the reality. Because death, whether we recognize it vocally, whether we, we say it out loud, whether whatever, however we think of it, death may be lurking around the corner for our loved ones. And friends, that terrifies us. Let's be honest about that. That terrifies us. We'll keep that inside, but it's there, percolating away. Why then was the first thing that came out of Jesus' mouth when he found out Lazarus was sick, the glory of his father and his own glory? Was Jesus uncaring, unloving? Of course not. John even tells us, in verse 5 of chapter 11, that Jesus loved Martha and his, her sister and Lazarus. He loved them. He was not uncaring. So why then? Well, as we think about this, even in our own experiences as a follower of Christ, truth be told, many of us would not, don't know what to do with Jesus here in this story, let alone in our lives, when it comes to these <sighs> sad times. Jesus seeks the glory of God, then he waits two days before he makes his way to Bethany, and it takes him two days to get there. Then we find out when the Lazarus had died on the very first day Jesus received the news. For the very, verse 17 tells us that Jesus found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. Was Jesus surprised? And on top of that, we know from the Gospels, and we know that Jesus could have healed Lazarus from Perea. He could have healed J uh, Lazarus from anywhere in the world. Remember, if you can, or you probably do, the Roman centurion of Matthew 8. The Roman centurion was a, a one who feared God, and he had a servant who was sick, and his care and compassion for that servant made drove him to see Jesus. So he went to see Jesus. And we know that that story has a lot to do about the faith of the centurion. And Jesus would say about his faith there, that he had never seen any faith like this anywhere in Israel. But the point is here. Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Jesus doesn't have to be with you physically. Jesus didn't have to be with Lazarus or with Mary and Martha to heal. He could have done it. He just had to say the word. Now Mary and Martha and Lazarus would have also known this. That Jesus just had to say the word and Lazarus would have been healed and spared death. All the sorrow and the pain they were experiencing, the grief could have been avoided. Friends, think about it. When someone we love suffers and dies, we often don't know what to do with Jesus. We don't. Moving along, we see from verse 20 to 37, there's so much going on that uh, we have to sort of limit ourselves to just a few points. First one, when we read this text, it's important to note that we are being invited in, us, 21st century people, invited into the text that reveals the traditional uh, Jewish time of mourning, which I would suspect is not too much different today. The events in the text reveal that many Jews had joined 
the sisters to comfort them, to mourn with them. And this time of mourning would go on for seven days. And Lazarus would have been entombed, or we would say buried, on the same day he died. And we're ready to know that the text tells us that Lazarus had been dead for four days by the time Jesus and his disciples showed up. We know today also that the prog- of, the, of the progression that occurs to a body after death left to its natural processes. 24 to 75 hours, somewhere in there. After death, the internal organs decompose. And it's no wonder then when Jesus said, take away the stone, then Martha said to him, but Lord, by this time, there's a bad order. Bad odor. It would have been stinky. The story also brings us close to the grief of this family. It brings us closely and intimately into the faith of Martha and Mary, the faith they had in Jesus. Was it a faith that could move mountains? No, it was a faith that was fragile. A faith that was uncertain. And a faith not unlike the disciples who often misunderstood what Jesus said and did. Yet despite their uncertainty, despite the pain, despite the grief they were enduring, they placed their faith in Jesus. And what's so astonishing and so wonderful about John's gospel, and particularly in our story here in John 11, is that he brings us very close to Jesus. He brings us very close to Jesus. Whatever questions one has about Jesus and how he dealt with this family are put to the side as John invites us into the very mind and heart of the Son of God. Whatever questions we have of Jesus with our experiences of suffering and loss, we put those to the side. For now we are drawn, compelled by the Scripture and by the Spirit to Jesus. To Jesus. What an insight we have here, what God has done for us in this chapter. And as we consider Jesus himself, we begin always by thinking biblically, because John does this throughout his gospel. And what we have here in this text, in John chapter 11, is the doctrine, the teaching of the two natures of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human at the same time. And unless we understand as best as we possibly can with our finite minds that Jesus is fully human and fully God, there is a great chance that we will most likely come to the wrong conclusion about Jesus. We will end up forcing upon this event here, this scripture here, unbiblical applications. Well, moving along, let's join me with uh, verse 32. We see that Mary uh, had gone, Martha had gone back home, pardon me. Mary accompanied, then accompanied by those mourning, went to see Jesus. And she fell at his feet, the story tells us, and repeated really what Martha had said to Jesus. She said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And this is where we really get close to Jesus, verse 33, his response. Because it brings us close to Jesus. Jesus saw Mary's tears. He heard her sobbing. And those who accompanied her, and John tells us that he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Folks, this phrase, deeply moved, is also translated in uh, other uh, sound translations, groaned. And the meaning of the Greek here always suggests anger, uh, emotional indignation, and outrage. But here's the point, folks. Yes, Jesus was deeply touched and moved when he saw Mary, whom he loved. When he saw her weeping, he was deeply touched. But let me ask you this question for you to consider. Was Jesus mourning the death of his dear friend Lazarus? Was he mourning his friend's death? What answer came to mind? If you answered no, you would be correct. He was not mourning his death. For we can reason, friends, biblically from John's choice of words, the context of his gospel, 
that anger welled up within Jesus at the pain and sorrow and death. Death, that sure reality for every one of us as a result of what? Sin. For Paul has already reminded us. For the wages of sin is death. And then next we notice that Jesus asked Mary, where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? And this particular verse should answer any questions about Jesus' motives for this verse is directly connected to verse 4, which we just heard earlier. Mary, Martha, and the Jews had no idea what Jesus had said back in Perea when he was told Lazarus was sick. For you see, folks, Jesus already knew four days before that it was his Father's will that Lazarus would be raised from the dead. Why? To comfort the family? I just want to say one thing. Just on a side note, friends, this is the biblical truth. You can find it for yourself. God is more concerned or interested in his glory than your comfort. I'm not saying he's not interested in your health. I'm just saying he's more concerned about his glory. And only God can be that, right? Was Jesus, was Jesus mourning the death of Lazarus? No. Why? For the glory of God and his son. And next we encounter what many consider the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Consider with me again the question that we already asked. Just five seconds ago, ten seconds ago, was Jesus mourning the death of his friend Lazarus? No. See, Jesus was not lamenting. Mary, Martha, and the Jews were lamenting, mourning, because he was short minutes from raising his friend from the grave. Well, what then? What can we say about this? Well, let the prophet Isaiah speak and give us commentary. This is what he said about Jesus, the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 53, verse 3, Isaiah said that Jesus was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. Friends, can I say this with certainty? That whatever you've endured, sickness, grief, pain, everything that the world can bring to us, everything that we decide to do that is hurtful to us or others, everything, God knows your sorrows. He knows your pain. He knows your grief. For he was a man of sorrows, Isaiah tells us. He was acquainted with grief. Thanks be to God that Jesus knows your grief and my grief. He knew that when I was sitting beside Sally. A few short days from this event, Jesus and the disciples would enter Jerusalem. We call this uh, tri the triumphal en entry. This is what we, we highlight usually on Palm Sunday. Crowds surrounding Jesus, thousands of people in loud voices proclaiming, Blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And Luke's Gospel tells us that as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, that he wept over it. Jesus wept over the city. And Jesus said, If, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden for you. He grieved over the city. And then later, the prophet Jesus announced that a day was coming that Jerusalem, that people and the city would be destroyed. Why? Because Jesus said this, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And this prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans came and leveled that city, pillaged that city, killed many, and took the rest into slavery. See, friends, Jesus wept over Jerusalem and those mourning the death of Lazarus. Why? Because Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief for a fallen world seized, captured by the result of sin, sorrow, and death. Well, moving into 38 to 44, 
What we have here is the last of the seven miracles of Jesus we find in John's Gospel. One commentator speaking of this miracle said, quote, the raising of Lazarus by Jesus is the most dramatic miracle in John's Gospel. It is the capstone of Jesus' public ministry. The capstone. And it's the only recorded miracle in the four Gospels where Jesus raised someone from the grave after four days dead. But I digress a bit. Why did Jesus raise Lazarus? Why did he raise Lazarus? And it seems here in this particular part of the event that Martha forgot when she reminded Jesus that removing the stone would expose everyone to a stench, a bad odor, a decomposing body. And Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? And with three three words, pardon me, Lazarus come out, the dead man came out. Remember what else Jesus said to Martha? Something that you have not heard yet? That's right here in the scripture. I am the resurrection and life, Jesus said. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by me, by believing in me, will never die. Well, friends, this is where we step away from the story. We step away as we bring this to a conclusion. A pastor once said this, quote, The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Indeed. You see, the last one to be resurrected in John's gospel is Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Because you see, the pastor is right. Jesus' resurrection changes everything. When we consider the Easter season, how we prepare ourselves and celebrate it, it can only truly come from this one biblical truth, folks. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. If you take the resurrection of the gospels, then biblical Christianity ceases to exist. You have some sort of other kind of Christianity. And it's no wonder of all the doctrines, the teachings that we find in the Bible, the resurrection is the most contested for. It is the one that the devil constantly attacks. And the same pastor said that the story we have in our text is more than some ancient story. This is not some tall tale, he said, like so many others that we have. And here's really the important bit. The resurrection of Jesus demands a response from you and me. Of course, many will not respond, will not listen, or even care to respond. In many ways, their lack of response is a response in itself. No thanks. Not interested. John reminds us at the very beginning of his wonderful gospel that Jesus, in other words, in him was life, that is Jesus, and that life was the light of all mankind. That through Jesus, all things were made that has been made. All things. And he's the light of the world. And Jesus said this as he prayed to his Father. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Well, folks, let's wrap this up with one last question. A very familiar question. Why are you a Christian? Lord God, we thank you for John's Gospel for chapter 11. Thank you for this amazing story we have here, this historical narrative. Thank you for how close we can be brought into our Lord and Savior, right into this family we have never met, their grief and their sorrow. And how, Lord, you are acquainted with our sorrows, that you, we can be uh, comforted to know that whatever is happening in our lives, you are there and you, you know exactly how we feel. And thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrection of life, that there is hope, that we who are followers of Christ do not grieve without hope. For one day, at the consummation of all things, everything will be right. And we will be with you for eternity. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for having me. God bless. Shalom.